It's the machine. We're talking about episode seven, Ghost in the Machine. It was written by Alex Gansa and Howard Gordon and directed by Gerald Friedman. It premiered on October 29th, 1993. It is a Monster of the Week episode. Reviews of this ran the gamut from being called one of the 15 best X-Files episodes by The Guardian to being called a big disappointment and totally pedestrian by one of the writers, Howard Gordon. Crystal City, Virginia is a real place. It's a suburb of DC. I think it's the home of the new headquarters for Amazon and it's absolutely full of defense contractors. Again. Don't you get it? You're killing me. You're killing my company. Eurisco is not your company, Brad. Not anymore. And you damn well better grow up and get used to it. At the top of this list is the immediate termination of the COS project. You know, this kind of looks like the Apollo guidance computer. It's disastrous performance over the past three quarters and projected losses well into 1994. Leave us no other choice. The central operating system is listening. It's always listening. Boy, that's kind of prescient, huh? Hello? Hello? At the tone. Eastern Standard Time, 7.35 p.m. File deleted. This is Wayne Duvall, the nephew of Robert Duvall, and he's got 100 plus credits to his name. He's still working. He's recently been in Billions, The Blacklist, and Righteous Gemstones. Mulder. Jerry. We're gonna hit a stretch of episodes where the writers kind of randomly drop in old co-workers or acquaintances, sometimes ex-boyfriends or girlfriends, to act as the story hook to get Mulder and Scully advancing the plot. You're Dana Scully, right? Jerry Lamont. Jerry and I work together in violent crimes. Work together? We talking work together. We were partners. The truth is I could use a little help on this. Now, I know a bullshitter when I see one, and this guy's a bullshitter. To meet you went your separate ways. I'm a pain in the ass to work with. Seriously. I'm not a pain in the ass. We had different career goals. He ran into a little bad luck in Atlanta working hate crimes. He had a little bad luck working hate crimes. Kind of bad luck. He misplaced the piece of evidence, bagged and everything, sent it to the cleaners. Oh, oh. You okay? I think Scully's drunk at work again. Yeah. What was that? Four, uh, seven, four, actually, I think eight, everything's four, okay. Nine, four, ten, four, eleven, four. Now this is a creative way to get a woman's phone number. Servo. They switched the ground to the negative so that when he put the key in the lock, he completed the circuit. It's fused. Yeah. It takes a lot of juice to melt a steel key. But whoever did it would have had to override the COS. What's the COS? The central operating system that runs the building. Regulates everything from energy output to the volume of water in each toilet flush. Why'd you ask him about the phones? Phones off the hook. Mulder is too clever by half. Maybe Drake was talking to somebody right before he did his Ben Franklin impersonation. Taught him everything he knows. All of which leads me to believe that our guy was some kind of sociopathic game player. Maybe even a recluse. Since he designed a trap not only to avoid detection, 
but to avoid contact with the victim. Hey, don't get all bent out of shape. Jerry, that was my profile. No, I didn't think you'd mind. I filled in the blanks. Jerry, you went into my office and you stole my work. Look, right, you're on this case because I asked you to help me out, and you helped me out. What is the big deal? One name, Brad Wilczek. He said it would be a short list. And it's headline news how much this guy despised Drake. That just seems too obvious. To kill Drake would be so brazenly egomaniacal. And fully consistent with Jerry's excellent behavioral profile. This is what a 220 IQ and a $400 million severance settlement buys you. Brad Wilczek? We're with the FBI. What took you guys so long? Oh, do you mind taking off your shoes? Brad is a stereotype here of the iconoclastic tech genius. You know, disheveled, barefoot, kind of spouting some vague New Age or, or Eastern philosophy. Let me show you something. Smart home. From this prototype, I have access to every square foot of my house. All right, I'm going to give credit again. This is our third prediction now. This is the smart home in 1993. Microsoft wouldn't come up with a consumer version called the home of the future until 1999. This place is as safe as Fort Knox and as energy efficient as your average igloo. Is this system related to the one in your corporate building? Variation on a theme. Could someone have uh, hacked into the system? Well, not your average phone freak, that's for sure. But there's plenty of kooks out there, data travelers, electro wizards, techno anarchists. Electro wizards and techno anarchists, yeah. Those are all very real things. Anything's possible. End of Field Journal, October 24th, 1993. That is the sound of the 90s right there. We borrowed this from the Voice Biometrics Lab at Georgetown. It's a computer spectrogram capable of identifying individual speech patterns. You're saying this is the same person? I'm saying that both voices are Brad Wilczek's. He may have disguised his voice electronically, but he couldn't alter the form it's unique to his own speech patterns. Which means that he was the one that killed Drake. Someone has to make sure Wilczek stays put. I'll go with you. No. Let me bring him in along. I need this one, Mulder. Okay, wait, this guy didn't do anything. Mulder and Scully have carried him the whole way. Welcome back, Brad. Jerry, no, take the stairs. Going up, second floor, third floor. Fourth floor, fifth floor, sixth floor, seventh floor, eighth floor, ninth floor. Going down. I heard about Jerry. I'm sorry. I don't think Wilczek did it. He just signed a confession. Dana still doesn't know that Mulder is always right. How much proof do you need? I need to know why Brad Wilczek is the subject of a Code 5 investigation. What the Defense Department wants with him. What do you think they'd want with the most innovative programmer in this hemisphere? Skynet? Yeah, I bet it's Skynet. Software. Uh. How much do you know about artificial intelligence? I thought it was only theoretical. It was. Until two years ago, you remember Helsinki, the first time that a chess playing computer ever beat a grandmaster? That was Wilczek's book. What about a third option? You created that machine. Now you tell me how to destroy it. 
Where are my Doom Bros at? We're going to call this the Muldurian Jihad against the thinking machines. Self-preservation. It's the primary instinct of all sentient beings. Well, but that level of, of, of artificial intelligence is decades away from being realized. And why was our government trying to use Zerp Wilczek's research? Number okay, if you read a few lines of what Scully's writing here, she asks, did Wilsick murder Drake in Oedipal Rage? This, this profiling thing is getting out of hand. I guess the writers must have thought that sounded smart. I need you to run a quick trace on a number for me. Yeah. 202-555-6431. Yeah, that's my number. Somebody's accessing my computer. Mulder! Scully, what are you doing here? Someone or something's been scanning my computer files, tapping my phones. I traced the line. It came from somewhere in there. How can we get in? Remember the Trojan horse? Trojan horse. Get it? You know, that's not bad for 1993. Oh, what the... for the element of surprise. What do you say we take the stairs? Oh! What are you doing? I want to make the same mistake Greg made. <laughs> I remember on the original airing that the prospect of the computer and basically the building itself trying to kill you was utterly terrifying. There should be a way for you to jump down and open the door. Scully is doing her best John McCain impersonation. Wait, John McClane. <laughs> Not bad, Agent Mulder. You know, I've been trying to access the CPU for the past two years. Put down the gun. Make no mistake. You will be held accountable. Mulder, put it in the disc. What are you doing, Brad? Brad. Brad. Why, Brad? Brad, why? You won't find it. They can't just take a man like Brad Wilczek without an explanation. They can do anything they want. The Department of Defense still hasn't found anything? Hmm. The guys who failed six consecutive audits? Who've lost more than $2 trillion in assets? Hmm. Been on it for five days. Wilsick's virus was thorough. Left no trace of the artificial intelligence. The machine is dead. What is dead may never die. Six more hours before we have to consign the whole damn thing to the metal shredder. We'll do what we can, sir. I mentioned Ghost in the Machine received mixed reviews. Me as a teenager thought it was pretty good. I immediately figured out the computer was responsible, but I thought the mystery was actually going to be how were Mulder and Scully going to figure out a way to stop it, you know, without just cutting the power to the building or something. Now, rewatching it, I have to say, I 
still kind of like it, even despite its corniness. It seems a bit more prescient now, especially with all the recent discussion about artificial intelligence. And there is, of course, a long history of killer computers and fiction. Star Trek, the original series, had at least three that I can think of, and that's basically the plot of 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, you're going to find that rather difficult. We meet Mulder's former partner, Jerry Lomana. A lot like Agent Colton from Squeeze, uh, he's this sort of grasping, ambitious ladder climber. He steals Mulder's profile notes and presents them as his own work. Then he tries to take full credit for the investigation by making the arrest alone. It does not work out for him. Scully, who does not believe in the notion of a murderous AI, ends up becoming maybe the first ever victim of cyberstalking. The COS would try to kill her uh, with a, an air duct fan, but she's too tough for that. She shoots it. Um, I'd like to take a moment to note that she has pulled her pistol in every episode we have seen so far. Deep Throat gives Mulder kind of the inside track to the government's involvement here and hints that there's some danger, maybe, in the DOD getting access to a seemingly sentient artificial intelligence. The writers, Alex Gantz and Howard Gordon, didn't like the final product. They admitted that they knew very little about computers, or programming, or probably electro-wizards. I think what this episode needed was a better-crafted mystery. It's pretty obvious from the start that the COS is responsible for the murder. However, it did have some genuinely good moments of action and suspense. And I think this episode also showed us that The X-Files isn't exclusively paranormal. There's room for some speculative futurism here, too. That's it. That's Ghost in the Machine. Next, I'll do trivia, and then number eight, ice. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. <laughs> 